everybody is wearing their masks today, at least until we come up here. All right. Well, thank you, Tim. I really, I personally resonate with that, and um, I want to respond to that, but I think that the Lord's would have me wait and go off script later when it probably fits a little more accurately in uh, in what the me- what God really put on my heart to share this morning. But let's pray. Well, God, first of all, we confess that, as Tim talked about, we are part of the problem. That we have hearts that are full of selfishness, and sin, and baggage, and junk. And we just bring our hearts to you this morning, and we want to lay them down at your feet, and ask that your Holy Spirit would move in and take over, and change and transform our hearts. Because that's the only way that our racism, and that our sin, and that our selfishness, and isolation and suspicion and all of these things can be dealt with is is only when it's you by your spirit changing our hearts and transforming our lives and so we just come and ask that you would speak to us this morning that through your word you would speak to our hearts what you want to say and that you would use this as part of that transformation process, part of that heart change process. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So in the last few weeks, Tim's been talking about the ways of Jesus, how Jesus was leading us and showing us the ways to follow him. And as he mentioned, today we're transitioning now to the Beatitudes in the book of Luke. But for today, I would first like to start with a story. Now, the background of this story is right, really, before Jesus told this story, and this is in Luke, uh, later on in chapter 16, Jesus says this. He said, No one can serve two masters. For you will hate the one and love the other. You will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who dearly loved their money, heard this, and they scoffed at him. And he said to them, You like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honors is detestable in the light, in the sight of of God. Luke chapter 16 uh, verses 13 through 15. So now for our story. There was a, a rich man and he lived in luxury, he lived in comfort, he had plenty of food, he had lots of things and as he he was living his life of luxury, there was a man named Lazarus that was laid out at his curb right in front of his house. He had to go by this guy on a regular basis. He saw him. Lazarus was poor. He was so poor. He, he did not have nice clothes. He, he had sores. He was sick. He had sores. And he just wished, he just wished this rich guy would just let him eat the scraps, the leftovers that fell from his table. But instead, he didn't get anything. And dogs came and licked his sores. That's pretty gross. Well, as it goes to happen, Lazarus dies. And it says that the angels carried him to the bosom of Abraham, or where, to Abraham. It says, then the rich man died, and he ended up in the place of torment. And as he's in the place of torment, he's, he's in anguish. He looks up and he, he sees over there that there's, there's Abraham, the patriarch of their of their religion and there's Lazarus the poor guy that's been sitting outside his gate and he says hey father Abraham let Lazarus dip his finger in some water and and drip it on my tongue to cool off and and calm or comfort my anguish 
And Abraham looks at him and goes, I can't. He says, during your life you had luxury and comfort and now you're suffering. He said, during his life Lazarus had suffering and sorrow and now he's being comforted. And by the way, there's this canyon between us so we can't go from here to there anyways. Rich man goes, okay, then send Lazarus to my brothers to warn them so they do not come to this place of torment. And Abraham's answer to him was, they have the law and the prophets. They have Moses and the prophets. He says, no, no, no. If, if, if you would just send Lazarus, if someone raised from the dead, they would believe and repent. Turn, change their minds and turn. And Abraham's answer to that is, no. They have Moses and the prophets, and if they won't listen to them, they're not going to listen to somebody that's raised from the dead or sees a miracle. That's the end of the story. So now, as we come to the end of this story, we're going to jump back to Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 20, if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles. Now, here's the scene. Just a little bit of setting the scene here. Jesus is... um, come down from the mountain, he's standing with his disciples. That's what the text specifically says. He's standing with his disciples. And then around him and his disciples gathers this crowd. And in this crowd, they're mostly um, people who do not really know who Jesus is. They've heard about him. They've brought their family and friends to come and hear him or get healed. But they really don't know him. They're just kind of there to find out what all the fuss is about. And also in this crowd, there are some that are described as, in the New Living Translation, as followers. So we've got Jesus with his disciples kind of in the center. This crowd, a mixed multitude or people around with all sorts of different backgrounds, including some people that would be described as followers of Jesus. So, as we come to the text in Luke chapter 6... It says this, Then he lifted his eyes, speaking of Jesus, towards his disciples and said, Blessed are you, poor, uh, blessed are you, poor for yourselves in the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, they revile you, and cast you out, uh, and call your name evil for the Son of Man's sake. Verse 23, rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did also did to the prophets. So, the first thing is, is Jesus actually turns and from this crowd he's been speaking to and healing and, and talking to, he turns and he looks specifically at his disciples. So this is something he's specifically saying to those disciples that have made those sacrifices to follow him. And what he says to them is he says, God bless you who are poor, hungry, weep, mocked, excluded, cursed in verses 20 and 21. Now, just imagine for a moment what we've already seen in the book of Luke. We saw that many of these disciples actually had left their jobs, their families. They had made sacrifices. They have given up so much to follow Jesus. Now, remember, Jesus was a homeless guy. He said, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So they're following Jesus. He doesn't have a home or a place for them to stay or hang out. They're probably experiencing some of these very feelings right now as he's speaking to them. And if they're not experiencing it right now, they soon will. So that's what he tells them. He says, blessed are you if you're poor, if you're hungry, if you're weep, if you're mocked. But here's why. He says in in, um, verse 23, 
Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is in, excuse me, in verse 22. He says, and if you reviled, you're cast out, your name is called for evil, for the Son of Man's sake. Here's the point. It's for the sake of his relationship, for the sake of our faith and trust in Christ himself. That is why the suffering comes. So the reason that some of this, that this suffering is, that he's talking about is taking place, it's because they were following the Son of God. Now, Jesus does say they're going to be rewarded. And he specifically says um, in verse 23, For indeed your reward is great in heaven. That's great. There will be a reward. When times are tough here, know this, that God is not going to fail you and that there will be rewards. There will be blessings. Many of them are on the other side. Just like Lazarus. Lazarus suffered. Lazarus was licked. His sores were licked by dogs. He was hungry. He suffered immensely. And yet in the afterlife, he was comforted. And then Jesus goes on and he compares them to the prophets of old. Now remember, and this, this really links. So one of the things I'm saying is God doesn't bless us because we suffer. God doesn't bless you because you're poor. God doesn't bless you because you suffer. God blesses us because we're following him and the suffering is a result of following him. And you're going, well, I don't know about that. Well, in the text, he mentions the prophets. You think of every prophet that God ever sent to speak. Most of them suffered immensely. And they suffered immensely because they were following God's path, God's ways. They were speaking God's word. Let me give you a couple of examples. So, one of the examples is Elijah. Now, Elijah was out doing his thing, farming. God says, hey, I want you to go talk to the king and tell him unless he repents, there's going to be a, a, a drought. And he goes and then tells him, and then he has to run away because he's going to get killed by the king for giving him bad news. He goes, God leads him, and he goes, and he, and he hangs out by a brook. And as, the, and as he's there, He's fed by ravens in the morning and the evening, so he's only getting two meals a day, and birds don't carry very much. You know, imagine a crow bringing you a little crumb of bread or something, and he had a little water from the, the stream. So even in his own life, as, as he was being obedient to God, it led him to a place of not having abundance, of, of getting only eating two meals a day. Um, and then when the, the uh, stream dries up, he has to move to somewhere else. Then later on in his life, there's this God does a great thing. There's this confrontation. Then he has to run for his life and he hides in a cave. Okay? So you can see, all of the prophets went through that stuff. Zechariah and all of them. Even, even Daniel. And Daniel's one of my heroes. I named my son after him. Um, I love Daniel. Daniel's probably one of the most blessed prophets of all the prophets. But you know what? Even he... Even though he was raised up to be a leader and an advisor to the king of Babylon, he still had suffering too. And his three friends. Remember, him and his three friends were taken as captives from their homeland and dragged out and exiled to a whole other country. That sounds pretty suffering to me. But it doesn't stop there. When he gets there... He voluntarily, with his three friends, choose to follow God's way and not drink the wine and eat the rich food, but to just eat water and vegetables. Okay, maybe he got a little bit hungry, because I know when I'm not getting meat and it's just water and vegetables, I'm not a happy camper. But it doesn't stop there. Later on, his enemies actually falsely accused him and get him thrown into a den of lions. So he's thrown to the lions. His three friends... They get thrown in a fire. So you can see, all of the prophets suffered. Even if they were blessed at some time, they suffered for their following the ways of God. The blessings, again, are not the result of suffering. 
They're the result of living life in the Spirit and reflecting Jesus. Because when we reflect Jesus, reflecting Jesus often causes suffering. Because when those that are not following the path of God will oppose and um, give us trouble. So, let me give some more real life examples. Tim doesn't know, but Tim, he gave up being a project manager to trust God and be dependent upon him and to go into ministry. I don't know all the details, but I can tell you this, that project managers have the potential of making some good money. And that potential earning was given up. So I don't know how it's affected you or the suffering that it's caused, but I bet if I sat down and we had a little interview that I would find that there were suffering that you experienced because of choices you made to follow where God was leading you. Let's try to give some others. So what the kind of the point of this is, is when he says, blessed are you when you are poor or these things, he's telling us that we're blessed when we follow his way and it leads to these things. Let me try to give some real life examples. There's Tim. When we went to the Philippines, um, I had a good job. I had made tenure, so basically I was pretty much set. They couldn't fire me. To give you an idea how strong the union was, there was a guy that raped somebody on the job, and because it got thrown out of court, they got him his job back. That's, that's how secure my job was. It's re- no, that's wrong. It's ridiculous. But the point of it is, I had security. And when God called us to the Philippines, when I turned in my notice, we had people tell us, you are stupid. And that's exactly the words he said. He said, you are stupid. We had Christians telling us, you sh- that's dumb, don't do that. You're giving up, because we were financially secure. We were, man, I had bought my first motorcycle. I had cars. We, had, we were buying a house. Um, and they said, you're dumb. So we went to the Philippines. We gave up that job. We gave up that income and that security. In the Philippines, it was even worse. <laughs> now, God blessed us, but when we first got there, we didn't have a car for the first several years. And then when we finally got one, it was a piece of junk. I had to push, I would have to, when I would park it, I would look for a hill to park it on because I was going 99.9% of the time I was going to have to push start it. Someone else has been there. I heard it, yeah. During those years, there were times that we couldn't afford much food. We ended up eating rice and banana ketchup. And banana ketchup is what it sounds like. It's mushed up bananas with some, some uh, spices and a little red di- uh, food coloring. Um, and when, you have white, when all you have is white rice to eat, you need something to give it some flavor. So you put banana ketchup on it. and So we've experienced that. Um, there were also, we, we could never afford vacations. We couldn't afford to go and do cool stuff. But you know what God always did? When we were there, again, we were there through earthquakes, volcanoes, um, all the crazy typhoons, crazy things. There There were a lot of difficult times. But yet, over the years, God did bless us. There were times that he sent friends of ours came over and they we couldn't afford to go on vacation, being on a missionary budget. They would actually um, they took us out to a really nice resort. They they did everything. They got the rooms. They got everything. They rented us kayaks. They they just did. And this was such a nice resort. Even you know we didn't have that kind of money to go to a really nice resort like that. So God blessed us. Um, someone else came over, and we love live theater, but you can't really afford live theater. Well. They bought us season tickets to basically the Broadway of the Philippines. And here we were, we'd park in the parking lot in our broken down piece of junk car between Mercedes and BMWs and Audis and, you know, all the, all the circle cars. And um, <clears throat> so then we'd go up and, and we actually met. We met the ambassador from Israel. There were rich people there. We even met um, Leah Salonga, who was the 
one of the leads in Miss Saigon on Broadway in New York. So God blesses us. God does do these things for us. So blessed are you when you're hungry. Blessed are you when you suffer because God is not ignoring your, your suffering. As we go through that, He goes through it with us and He will bless you. And it doesn't always have to wait till we get to heaven. Yes, He will bless us because it specifically says in the text when, when we get to heaven. But He does bless us now as well. So this is not just religious pie in the sky in the you know, in the by and by or hang out and just suck it up until we get to the afterlife. Jesus gives us life and he gives us life abundantly. That's what he said. I came to give them life and give them life more abundantly. And I've just given you some examples of how even through suffering we can experience that abundant life. This doesn't mean you can't have money or food or joy or have fun. Remember Job? Job was the richest guy in town. And he was following God. He was just he he had it going on, right? And yet the enemy comes and whispers into God's ear and says, "Hey, you know what? Job's just following you because you got him you got his back." And he's accusing him not because Job was a bad person. His accusation was against Job's faith, Job's trust in God, Job's belief. And look what happened to Job. He, his, all his kids were killed. All his material wealth was taken and stolen and destroyed. Um, his wife told him, curse God and die. His friends were lousy friends. And they came and they made him feel worse. And he suffered and he questioned God. He said, God, what's up with this? But at the end, God restored him. God blessed him. So it's not wrong to have riches and joy and these things. God often gives those to, the, to his people, but we have to accept with those good things, we can also have to accept the suffering. So here's the fact. The fact is, if we follow Jesus, we will experience these things along the way. Because the ways of Jesus are not easy And they may include times of poverty, hunger, and sorrow. Jesus was poor. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He experienced hunger, especially during his temptation. He wept. He was mocked. He was excluded. He was cursed by the religious leaders. And why? Because of his obedience and trust in following God's ways. So, if Jesus experienced those things... If we follow him, we're going to experience those things too. So it's not a surprise. So here's the point. The point is Jesus' way may lead us away from riches, comfort, and an easy life. But he blesses us with his abundance along the way as we follow him. So point one, if you're taking notes, and it's good the projectors are not here, I'll give it to you. If if we follow Jesus, we can expect suffering now in this life. But then he goes on, and Jesus in verse 24 actually changes his tone, and he says, But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all the men speak well of you, for so did their fathers of the false prophets. So as we look at come to this part of the text, the second half, This has been a question that has bothered me and pretty much Christians for forever, is why do wicked people prosper? I don't have an answer for you today. I am sorry. But we do know that David, Job, so many in the Scripture have recorded that question. Well, why why did the righteous suffer and the... The unrighteous prosper. Look at the rich man in our story. He had it all. He prospered. And look where he ended up. He ended up separated and in torment. So 
And he knew. It's not like, oh, he didn't have a choice or he didn't know. He knew. Remember back in the story when he says, hey, you know, send, send Lazarus to my brothers so they don't come to this place of torment? He realized, whoa, my brothers are going to come here. Because he knew his brothers weren't following God's ways. And so when Abraham says, well, they have the law and the prophets, that indicates, as we look at that, as I was thinking about that, that indicates that this guy, this rich guy, knew what Moses and the prophets had said. His brothers knew or know what Moses and the prophets said. And that's why when Abraham goes, hey, they have Moses and the prophets, your brothers should listen to them. And he says, no, 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 you got to send, you know, you, you got to send Lazarus. If someone raised from the dead, then we would be able to, um, they would believe. And, okay, and Abraham says, no, they won't believe. Even if there's a miracle, because miracles don't change our minds or our hearts, as Tim was talking about. God's Holy Spirit changes our hearts, and when we follow Him, it changes our lives. So, with that, we also go on and He gives, he, he gives some warnings here as he, he now addresses those who are rich and happy and, and so on and so forth. He says, hunger, mourning, and sorrow await you. Now, again, just as blessings are not the results of sorrow, sorrows are not the results of blessings or riches. Just being rich does not mean you have to have sorrow to count. It's not like there's this weight here that's, oh, I got rich, so I need to have some sorrow to counterbalance it. No. But these are general principles. Is Sorrow is not the result of being prosperous or rich, but sorrow is the result of, of ignoring the ways of Jesus to become prosperous and rich. Does that make sense? That there's, there's a difference there. It's, it's not a cause and result. It's really the, the sorrow is, is more of because we ignore God's way to become rich or prosperous. So the rich man in our story, he knew about living God's ways. He had the law and the prophets. And then he gives the warning. He says, warnings to you if those that are not following God's ways speak well of you. So... If, if those who are in rebellion or not following God's ways speak well of you, if you've got a good reputation among them, um, and we should, caveat, we should have a good rep, rec, reputation among them as followers of Christ, but it should be in relation to how we live out our faith. It should not be because we're like them. Does that make sense? All right. So, the rich man in our story, he knew it. He knew what was going on, but he chose not to. There's these warnings. So be careful. Be careful when those who you know are not following God, they're following their own path or whatever. If, if they really like you and it's not because of your faith, ingat, be careful. Ingat Tagalog for be careful. I used to use that in preaching a lot, so it kind of snuck up, snuck out there. All right, so here's the, what the question really is for us today. The question is, are we following God's ways? That's the question for us. Because it's not about what we have. It's what we do with what God has given us. If God blesses us with riches or with prosperity, then what we should do is thank God for those blessings, but then we should use them the way Jesus would. So if God's blessed you with material things, use them to bless others. Let me give you some examples. Um, when we were early, started to follow Jesus, um, we taught Sunday school. That's usually kind of the entry level for ministry. So if you're looking to get involved, you can help with children's ministry. And there was a guy, yes, amen, louder. There was a guy in our children's ministry that 
um, at first I didn't know this, but they were rich, like really rich. And later on we found out, and, but he didn't, he didn't come in, he didn't drive a big fancy car, expensive stuff, he didn't dress with you know, suits and ties and diamonds and bling and stuff. So we didn't know. But he started, he started, we were doing some training for the children's ministry, and he was paying for everything. They would have us over to their, their, uh, their dairy, one of their businesses, uh, where they lived, in this gigantic house, and they had this big room. He bought all the food, and we're talking good stuff, you know. We're talking filet mignon sometimes, or, or you know, just really good at what, you know, he wasn't bringing in, you know, Arby's or... Uh, you know, in and out burgers. Now, in and out burger probably would have been good, but he really put on the feed bag. He really, and we found out they're really stinking rich. But they use their riches to bless God's people. You know, um, there's people even along here that own summer homes or vacation homes, and, and they'll let believers or pastors or church people um, use them instead of renting them out and making money off of them all the time. Now, I'm not saying they don't ever rent them out, but I mean they're willing to give up a week's um, income from these homes to be able to bless God's people. Is, are we tracking here? That's kind of, if God's blessed you, then use it. Use it for Him. And so this is, this is our, our second point. If we live for ourselves now... We will suffer the consequences. Because that's the definition of sin. Living for ourselves. Following our own path. Or any path that isn't God's path. So, to just kind of sum it all up. If you're here today or you're listening, if you can hear my voice in... God wants you to, and you're not really, you don't really know who Jesus is or know much about the ways of God or you're just kind of interested. God wants you to know today that He does not desire you or anyone else to perish. He wants to give you abundant life. He wants to give you life that lasts forever. Now there are many, but the problem is there are many ways that we can follow in our lives. We are all born following a way that is not Jesus' way. Every one of us. Whether we're following our own way or some other way. We're born following other ways. The bad news is, is when we follow any way, doesn't matter what it is, other than Jesus' ways, then the result is separation from God. And we miss out. The result is death. And it's, you know, the brokenness and the suffering and the sorrow that Tim talked about that we're experiencing in our country, racism or the isolation from the COVID or the economic difficulties or any of these things. Those are the results of sin. Maybe not personal sin, but the sin that happened in the garden, the very first sin that broke everything around us and broke the world. And so our choosing to live our own way, sin, and the result of that, this brokenness, this sorrow, is the wages of sin, which is death. However that death may come, whether it's physical and or spiritual. But this brokenness, this suffering, this racism, they cannot be fixed by the activist way. They cannot be fixed by the social media way. They cannot be fixed by a legal way or a political way or any other way you can think of because the problem is not the situation. The problem is our hearts. And as Tim said, it's the hearts on both sides he didn't stop, um, well, let me, the, the problem is, 
it's sin. And because uh, that sin leads to the wages of death, what God did, well, let me back up a little bit. The only way for these sorrows to end is when we, every one of us, both sides, all sides, choose to follow God's ways and let God transform our hearts by doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And as Tim mentioned, that's changing our hearts. The problem is sin. But how does God deal with sin and its wages, which is death? Jesus, who is God, by the way, if you not, don't know that, he came to earth, he lived God's way perfectly, and then Jesus voluntarily sacrificed on the cross his life to pay for those sins. But at this point, he didn't just stop there. Because if he just paid for our sins, we still have a zero balance. We have no credit. We have no way to get in to please God. He's just taking away our display, how we displease God. But he didn't stop there. He took all of his goodness, all of his obedience to God, and he took it and put it on our account. And now we're pleasing to God, not because of what we did, but all of our credits come from who, what Jesus did. Jesus gave us his credit. Wow. And so, we're not performance-based. God's not looking for our performance. Jesus has already done, has already performed what needs to be performed. We just need to live in it. We need to embrace it. We need to accept it. Now, here's my response to what Tim shared earlier. <sighs> this isn't my notes, and I really don't want to admit this. I'm a recovering racist. You're going, no, really? Yeah, I know I look like a racist. But I wasn't a racist because of, well, I, I was racist because uh, a friend of mine lived in this very... Um, this very poor part of town, and due to many of the uh, inequality between our races, there was a significantly higher number of African Americans in that part of town. Um, the police didn't even like going in that part of town. Well, we were going to my friend's house, and I was with my friend and a couple other guys, and a gang jumped us and beat us. That was, that was bad. A couple years later, we're in the same part of town, and this is about bad on me. This is why I didn't want to admit this. <clears throat> so there was a liquor store in that part of town that sold to minors, because if you were brave enough to go in that part of town, they really didn't care. And so we went there to get beer. And so um, the oldest, most mature-looking of us her name was Rosie, went in to get the beer. And me and my friend sat in the car. And a large gang surrounded our car, pulled my doors open and beat me again and broke my nose. To this day, my nose is still kind of whopper jawed and don't always breathe right. The point of all this is just to admit, I carried a chip on my shoulder and I was racist because of those events. Later on, after coming to follow Christ, he changed my heart. I didn't join a program. or It wasn't something that changed my mind. It's as Jesus comes in and changes our hearts, changes why we do what we do, and changes what we think and why we think it. 
When he does that, he starts to melt away. And I didn't even realize it, but over time, God started to, to, to deal with that baggage, to deal with those feelings, to deal with the... And he started to push them down and to really remove them uh, from my life. Then when we lived in the Philippines, I experienced what it was actually like to be a minority. Now, I didn't get beaten up, but definitely when you live in a culture where you are outnumbered a million to one, well, maybe not that many, a thousand to one, there's, just, there's definitely um, a pressure to it. There's, there, you've, you feel out of sorts when you, especially when you live in it year after year after year. When you go for a, a, a trip, you can kind of get through it. But when you live in it long term. But when God brought us back, and again, this is all the stuff that wasn't in my notes. Um, he led us to North Carolina to plant a church. And God did amazing things. But one of the things that most blessed my heart is he took that final whatever it is uh, that I was harboring and basically dragged it out of my life. And God put us in a situation where we were ministering in a poorer part of town, a very high African-American population. And it was the Deep South. It was North Carolina. And... Racism is real. And, you know, I was born and raised here. And we, don't, we don't experience it as much. What we, do, we do have it here, but it's not as obvious or to the nth degree as it is in the South. And by this time, living in the South, um, I saw terrible racism. And it made me sick. It's not glorifying to God. And that's when I realized that God had brought, how far God had brought me. Our church was very mixed. Um, we had African Americans and, and um, Hispanics and, and white people. We, we, pretty, we had Asians. We pretty much had everybody. Um, and, I, and it was really neat. One day we went to this place called Carowinds. It's a... Uh, um, an amusement park, and we took the youth group. And so here's my kids, so lily white, they may make Tim look tan, blonde hair, and they're arm in arm. So, so one, of, one of the my elders is walking with me, and we're back, and his kids are right next to my, his daughter's arm in arm with my daughter, his son's arm in arm with my son, and he's black. So you have this lily white blonde haired girl arm in arm with this this African American girl and my blonde son with his son and um, then there were some uh, some Hispanic folks uh, actually they were from here in Southern California they'd relocated there and they ended up you know in in the group together and, and we were walking along and he, he he nudged me and he goes I have never seen anything like that ever before in my entire life like what Tim said, Sunday's probably the most segregated, especially in the South. And it brought us to tears as we watched these kids that didn't care what color they were, they didn't care, they just knew they loved each other. And they were friends, and they were having fun. And that's when I realized that it really doesn't matter what's on the outside. It matters what's on the inside. It's easy to say that, but it's much, much harder to believe it in real life. And I still deal with feelings, you know, when something, ha there will be things that happen that, that stir up junk from my past, but God never fails to go, eh, where's that coming from? And then he brings me back to remember on that day and that, that sight, and wow, that's the way it should be. Because in heaven, there's not going to be black churches and white churches and Latino churches and Asian churches. There's only one church. Right now, right here, there is only one church. 
And that church is the church of Jesus Christ. And it, every single person that follows Jesus is part of that church. And we need to love each other. So I'm sorry uh, for going off, but that was, that's my response. But the point is, it's only a changed heart that leads to a changed life. And if you're hearing my voice today and you are not following Jesus and you need a changed heart, then here's what, here's what God says, here's what we can do. The first step is to admit. Admit that the way we're following isn't working. The next step on the journey is to change our minds, which leads to a change of action. And that means just agree with God that His way is the right way, the only way that our hearts can be changed, and then asking Him and letting Him, by His Spirit, change our hearts and our lives. And then finally, ask Him to forgive us of living our own way and not God's way, because that's what sin is, living our way and not God's way. So if God's spoken to you today, I'm, just, I'm not going to lead you in a prayer but I want to give you a moment to respond to God. And so, if you've never followed Him before and you want to, then as we take this moment, just tell Him. Just admit, say, God, the way, the way I'm following isn't working. I believe that Your way is the right way. Help me. Forgive me. Fill me with Your Spirit. Change my heart. And I guarantee you, He will do it. I want to give us a few minutes now. Let's all just bow our heads. And really, at this moment of silence, just use your own words and be honest with God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for each and every one that's physically here and for all of those that are uh, listening over the, uh, the, the live stream. And I pray that you would manifest yourself, that you would reveal yourself to each and every one. That each and every one of us would experience you and that you would be changing our hearts and changing our lives. And we thank you for who you are and for what you've done. Amen. And if you're on the live stream or if you're here and you have not been following the ways of Jesus and you want to, if you're here, come and talk to Tim or myself or one of the other elders. If you're on the live stream, email us, call us, contact us. We want to help you. Thanks a lot.